morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Today we're talking about, talking about hope. And it's not necessarily the hope in our lives um, for what we're going through, but in the hope of the future of the church and the future of our faith. And it, it's a hard thing to take into, it's a hard thing to think about because a lot of times we're overwhelmed with the responsibility of, of growing the church or the responsibility of testifying as if we were responsible for the salvation of others. But ultimately, it's not us that's bringing salvation. It's God, and it's God working through us. And there's, it's there that he's done it already. You know, we, we have hope that he can work through us, you know, uh, through Jonah and the Ninevites, through uh, so many people we know and people we love. Um, he's done it before. And this is a song called Do It Again. And I think it's something that we should think about today as Bruce gives, gives us the message. So I hope you sing with me. If not, it's a beautiful song. I hope we'll meditate on it. And um, yeah, this is Do It Again. <laughs> I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won
Sunday. I, uh, and good morning to you, Pastor Garrett. It's great to see you once again. I know you had a whirlwind week between moving and this position and birthdays, Declan's first birthday this past uh, Thursday and the party yesterday. Are you rested? I, I trust. <laughs> You're here. All right. <laughs> well, know that we're, we've been praying for you, brother. So, uh, you know, uh, speaking of prayers, part of my prayer time involves the upper room. And I, uh, I get God incidences quite often. Uh, on September 12th, when Chloe was baptized, the upper room story, uh, just a part of it, was uh, talking about uh, a a young person whose grandmother helped raise her and lead her toward the Lord. So, you know, it kind of reminds me of what's going on in my life. My grandmother worked hard to care for my brother and me, especially for, uh, you know, after her granddad died. Imagine 70 years old and facing the daunting task of raising two teenagers. The prayer was, thank you, loving God, for parents and grandparents who create a positive, everlasting influence on their children by centering their lives on your word. Then this morning, today, I'm going to focus on hope, the gift of hope. And what is the, what is the message this morning? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Showy faith may look good, but just like my show, Muscles, it's unable to withstand challenges or win even the smallest victory in life. On the other hand, sure faith relies on the power and the promises of God and helps us stand when the floods come, lift burdens, spread hope, and move mountains. Just, just another God incident, what can I say? I wanted to uh, highlight Lady Sunday uh, in this regard, we, uh, we have a, uh, a really hardworking group of folks in this church, and uh, few can just sit around and uh, enjoy Sunday mornings uh, in the pew without putting a little bit of time in during the week. 
And uh, God bless you and, and know that your efforts are paying off. I just want to remind you of the history of Laity Sunday. Laity comes from the Greek work, uh, word laikos, meaning of the people. If you remember in the early days of the American Methodism, the lady served and maintained congregations between visits of the circuit riders. Clergy were assigned to travel around on horseback within some specific geographic region, regions to minister to settlers and to organize several congregations. It could be weeks between visits. Methodists have a long history of recognizing the ministry of the laity. Back in 1928, Methodists observed Laity Sunday. They called it Layman's Day. So with that, happy Layman's Day. Now we'll have a praise hymn, Your Name is Holy. Father, thank you for your word and all your promises. Your word tells us that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. By the power of the Holy Spirit, cause us to truly make you the Lord of our lives. When you look upon us, may you see a people whose hearts are turned toward you. Speak to our hearts and change our lives. It is you in whom we place our trust. Fill our nation with reverence and respect for you, O Lord. We rejoice in you, for you fill us with hope. Shower us with mercy, deliver us from our enemies. You are our help and our shield. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a couple reminders uh, before I give the vision statement. Uh, if uh, you haven't already, if you'd like to donate for the crop walk, we're going this afternoon. Maybe you could join us. I'll hook you up with a green shirt. And um, yeah, so uh, if you care to donate, you can uh, write out a check to AUMC, uh, cash, or even use that Vanco app if you have that. The other uh, bit of news is the newsletter. Uh, October's flying by, so uh, think about getting those uh, news items to Lynn Radley as soon as you can. And now for the vision statement. We are a Christ-centered family of Christians. We are actively seeking to grow the kingdom of God by bringing the word and the love of God to the community. We may not always think alike, but we always love alike as God has taught us. And now we'll hear from Ann. Good morning. We have some children. Hi. Glad to see everybody. Well, God, um, Bruce was talking about God instance, and that's what I'm talking about today is Lady Sunday. And so let's see if the children especially remember. Who are the lady? It's everybody. It's us. The only person who isn't a lady is an ordained minister. So we are the workers. And when you're in school, what is a tool that you need to work with? A pencil, right? Pencils are extremely important. Well, today, I'm going to use pencils as a little illustration. So the first one is a pencil that's not sharpened on either end. Can you do any work with that? No. It reminds me of some people who never seem to do anything. They just sit around and let everybody else do the work. A pencil that isn't sharpened on either end isn't much good for anything, and neither is a person who does nothing. Second, I have a big eraser. Now, erasers, huh, you erase all your mistakes, but it also reminds me of people who don't do anything right or think that they can't do anything right. And because they get so nervous, they don't do anything at all. So they're just as bad as the person who, the pencil without any point. Then there's a pencil that is sharpened on both ends. Wow, you can have fun with that one, right? It doesn't have an eraser because it never thinks it makes any mistakes. It's also someone who's just very busy all the time and maybe they get a little too busy and they don't concentrate on what is extremely important, the most important things. And last, we have a pencil that's got an eraser on one end because we all make mistakes and a point because we can do work. This is the kind of worker that we need in the church. They're trying to do a good job. Now, you don't have to be an adult to be a lady person you don't have you can be a kid what kind of work can a child do well for one thing you're doing work when you go to Sunday school when you come here and you listen and for there are pencils that have to be collected I know uh, Miss Linda is collecting pencils for a cause there's a bazaar that's coming up if you're a teen you can work outside taking care of weeds. There's lots of things that kids can do. And as adults, when someone asks us to do something, we need to say yes instead of saying, oh, I don't know if I can do that or not. So all of us, no matter what our age, we have something that we can do for the church. We are workers for Christ. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I'd like to share this week's Acts 29 with you. And I'd like to take us back to the second book of Kings, 19 through 10. I'm not going to read it to you, or 19, 10 through 20. But it does tell a story about King Hezekiah in the midst of a battle. And you ask, okay, what's the importance of this? Well, let me tell you, because unlike King Hezekiah, you're probably not facing the invading army, but you're like most of us. Your life is nonetheless full of obstacles, problems, and everyday needs that threaten your sense of peace and security. So what do you do about that? Do you call a friend? Do you look on those self-help books? Do you see what Dr. Phil says to do? Or do you rely on your own strength? No, we call out to God for help because he is our source, and he knows the problems that we're going to face even before we do. So let me tell you a few things here. Prayer, which makes us aware of our dependence on God, and no concern is too small for him. And he wants us to come to him with everything, small or big, even just the smallest things. Like, I just thank God. I'm just like, okay, thank you for getting me to work home and safely because there's just so many crazy people out there on the road. So I just say a quick prayer before I leave. And that may seem small to us, but God wants that one too. And in fact, he tells us not to even worry about a thing. Don't worry, but pray to him for everything. And we can pray small and for big things. And also, the outcome of a prayerful dependence is peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding, not the peace that the world gives, but the peace that the Christ gives us when we just give things over to him and we just feel this sense of peace just coming over us. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. And prayer, it's a privilege that God has given his children, and it lets us humbly lay our cares before him and trusting him to direct our path and to provide our needs. He is our Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. So this week's Acts 29 is to press into God and the power of prayer. And what we may think is impossible, it's not impossible for God. And also, my dare to you, because I think I dared you last week, I'm going to dare you again, is to pray big this week. And watch and see what the God who created this whole world does for you. And don't forget, don't keep that to yourself. Tell your friends and tell your family because that will also, that'll just make you feel good and that'll have an impact on their life too because you may be that first person and the only person that they see the message, that they see the light of Christ. So I I thank you. And blessings to everybody, and have a great week. And remember your Acts 29 challenge. God bless all. Thank you, Kim. Now join me with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we have a special music. Here I am, Lord.
Good morning again, everybody. Today's reading is in the, um, in the Testament, the Old Testament, Psalms 33, 11 through 22. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. That's you and me. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice. We trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Father God, bless this message. Bless our brother in Christ, Bruce, as he delivers the message that you have put in his heart, and let it be a blessing for all. In your name, Jesus. Thank you, Kim. I just have to uh, go back and give creds to our great music leadership. Uh, nice job, uh, that outside uh, venue is really uh, expanding. It's uh, amazing and uh, your innovation is to be applauded. I, I just... It's a beautiful thing. So today's sermon is going to focus on hope, and specifically the, the gift of hope. A friend of mine at work uh, told me a joke a couple weeks ago. It was about a woman, uh, a shoplifter, who was hoping for a good outcome in front of a judge. So this woman was caught shoplifting some food and was found standing in front of the judge. The judge asked the woman, how many peaches did she estimate there were inside that can of peaches she, that she stole? The woman said, six peaches. Based on that information, the judge decided to sentence her to six days in jail. The woman's husband, who was sitting in the courtroom, shouted out, Judge, don't forget about the can of peas. All right, so the definition of hope. Now, it depends if we're talking about the noun or the verb. The noun version is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. The verb is to cherish a desire with anticipation. The Bible has the word hope in it 180 times. Chris, if you'd show the, uh, the anchor. So during storms, sailors would let down their anchors to try and keep their boat and themselves safe. The anchor links to solid ground. In Christianity, the anchor is the symbol for hope based on Hebrews 6.19, where Paul said the following, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. So by linking with God, we are safe even during the troubles of our life. Let me uh, point down here to this sign in front of me. It's the Cancer with Hope sign. Uh, Taylor Wilings and I sat around in the very beginning of Cancer with Hope and we were, you know, brainstorming uh, what the sign might look like. We were going to put out front, out on the on the church lawn. And uh, one of the things that that we considered was what color to make it. You know, it's today or this month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so a lot of people are uh, showing pink. In fact. Uh, 
uh, Friday night, there was a, a white dog that walked by with a pink tail, big fluffy pink tail. So, <laughs> over there on the third Friday activity. Um, so uh, back in uh, September 2018, we considered other things besides the color of the sign. The, the lavender color is for all cancers. Um, each cancer seems to have their own color. Uh, so lavender is for all cancers. The font design sizes was considered, you know, how big the font is for cars driving past the church. And the saying, your community support group, was something that we came about. The name itself, Cancer with Hope, at first uh, was thinking about cancer partners, but when I Googled that, I found that there was a group in Arizona that already had used that name. Cancer with Hope seemed to be okay and free and available, so that's how that came about. In hindsight, that Cancer with Hope naming was a good choice. Hope is so important for everyone, especially those who are struggling in this world. Many of the participants in the Cancer with Hope group have a, a strong faith, which has allowed them to better deal with their own cancer journey. You may remember I've written about Carol's, uh, Carol Fenimore's determination to create something good out of something very troubling in her life and her selfless behavior during her cancer journey. Carol surrendered her life to God and his will. Whatever he decides for her, she's at peace with. She uses her strong faith to reach out to other cancer patients she comes in contact with on her doctor visits and in our group to reassure them and to remind them to look to our eternal God of hope during these trying times. What a ministry, Carol. God bless you. Tim Keller, a pastor, a theologian, a Christian apologist, he survived thyroid cancer and is presently dealing with stage four pancreatic cancer, nasty cancer. This aggressive disease usually claims its victim within a year. Through chemotherapy and his body's good response to it, he's hopeful for remaining alive for years, not months. Interesting, he happened to be writing a book entitled Hope in Times of Fear. He said, here I am writing a book about the resurrection and I realize I only half believed I was going to die. I went back and realized that in some ways, I only half believed in the resurrection. Not intellectually so much, but all the way down deep in my heart, I realized I needed to have greater, a deeper faith in the resurrection, both intellectually and mentally, he recalled. Keller said it took several months in which I had to take my abstract belief down into my heart to existentially and experientially know it and grow in assurance. And it worked. He said, if you're willing to embrace the truth of God's word and immerse yourself in it day in and day out, and then ask the Holy Spirit to make it real to your heart, he will. Most people live in denial of death, Keller said, but facing one's own mortality and spiritual reality changes the way we view our time on earth and magnifies the transformative power of the resurrection. He said he knows the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened, and when I die, I will know that resurrection too. The Apostle Paul knew suffering quite well, as a Pharisee, he caused much suffering before he became a Christian. He participated in the persecution of early disciples of Jesus Christ. And then after his Christian conversion, he suffered in many ways, including by being whipped numerous times, beaten with rods, stoned, and imprisoned. Paul said the following from Romans 5, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Let me say it one more time. 
Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Warren Wearsby, a pastor and writer, said the following. We're prone to want God to change our circumstances, but he wants to change our character. We think that peace comes from the outside in, but it comes from the inside out. So I believe where there is hope, there is peace for the true Christian. When we relinquish our will and our life and give in to his will, then we will find peace through the hope of eternal life. Jesus said the following from John 16, My, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You may uh, remember Alexandre Dumas. He was the writer of The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers and dozens of other books. He said something kind of interesting. He said, there's neither happiness nor misery in the world. There's only the comparison of one state with another. Nothing more. He who has felt the deepest grief is best able to experience supreme happiness. We must have felt what it is to die that we may appreciate the enjoyments of life. Live then and be happy, beloved children of my heart, and never forget that until the day God will deign to reveal the future to man, all human wisdom is continued in these two words, wait and hope. You remember... Uh, We'll keep the light on, Tom Bodet. We, had, we were inundated with commercials, uh, maybe it was 10 years ago or before. Uh, Tom Bodet, uh, he's an author and advertising voice for Motel 6. He had an interesting uh, statement. They say a person needs just three things to be truly happy in this world. Someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. As many of you know, uh, I work as a bus driver for New Jersey Transit. And presently, I drive uh, in the morning, I, I do anyway. I drive uh, from Camden down Broadway through the heart of Camden. And uh, I drive uh, past a corner, it's uh, Chestnut and Broadway. And if you're, probably few of you are, but if you were familiar with that area, you would uh, recognize that as a, a very active drug corner. It's a busy drug area. Well, just three or four blocks further down, south of that on Broadway, there's Atlantic Avenue on Broadway, and just a half block away is a methadone clinic. The clinic helps their clients who are opioid addicted when I compare the type of person that gets off at Chestnut Street versus Atlantic Avenue, there's a world of difference. My, from my perspective, those individuals involved with the illicit drug activity are often angry and ungrateful. Those individuals, uh, on the other hand, are getting off at Atlantic Avenue to receive their drug treatment are polite and very grateful to me. So that interaction that I feel, I think represents the difference, the hope factor. One group is hopeless, while the other is full of hope. 1 Corinthians 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. As uh, has been talked about already this morning, where there is hope, there is peace. Psalms 4, in peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Psalm 119, great peace have those who 
love your law and nothing can make them stumble. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you, Lord. And then Jesus said to the woman in Luke 7, your faith has saved you, go in peace. One more quote from Jesus. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. C.S. Lewis, the British writer and scholar, and considered a lay theologian. Lewis authored over 30 books, including Mere Christianity, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Screwtape Letters, and he talked about hope. Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world, such as the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, C.S. Lewis says, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. I want to say it one more time. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. Pretty cogent words. Uh, a Friday or two ago, a U.S. senator told a gathering of religious folks last, uh, was, yeah, it was about two weeks ago, that the faithful need a baptism of courage as they encounter new pressures from the secular world. He said, I just want to say to you that it's my firm conviction that in this hour, in this time of testing for our nation and for us as believers, what we need as believers, above all, we need a baptism of courage. He said at the Pray, Vote, Stand Summit in Leesburg, Virginia. He also said this, we also need a baptism of hope because it's hope that gives us courage. I, uh, as you know, I'm a part of the Acts 29 group, uh, and uh, Lindsay knew uh, what my uh, uh, sermon was going to be about, and she sent me a, an appropriate. Here's a, a, a verse that she had uh, written out and had uh, at the third Friday, had, had it on the table. It's from Philipp First Philippians. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm uh, in the middle of reading a book. It's, got, it's the longest title. It's uh, from Jean Twenge. She's a psychologist at the University of San Diego. The title is iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, Less Happy, and Completely Unprepared for Adulthood. Hold on, I need to get this clipboard. <laughs> in, the, in the book, she highlights, uh, she surveyed a number of uh, folks. This one group was 18 to 24 year olds. 
and it's their religious beliefs. This was a, a survey done in 2005. And when they got the results, there was 87% belief by these 18 to 24 year olds, belief in the afterlife. Compare that to 2015. It dropped 7% to 80%. Asked uh, if they ever pray, 83% in 2005 of these young people prayed. Presently, well, or a little closer to the present, it's probably dropped even further. 74% in 2015. Believe Bible is the inspired word of God. 82% in 2005. 73% in 2015. Another survey that I wanted to share with you from this book. The percentage of 12th graders who ever attended religious services. Well, it all depended on where you lived. If you grew up in the South, it was 83%. If you grew up in the Midwest, it was 77%. If you grew up in the Northeast, where we are, 69%. So, Keep that in mind as we show a Jim Gaffigan, it's a, about a minute long, a Jim Gaffigan. By the way, Jim Gaffigan was a comedian that was here in Philadelphia when the Pope visited. He was the uh, warm-up act, believe it or not, for the Pope. So uh, <laughs> go figure. Thanks, Chris. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and if you've been there, you know they mean that sarcastically. <laughs> I love Philly, but saying Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love is a little bit like saying Syria, a place for peace. <laughs> but I love Philly. I lo you know, I love the whole Northeast. I'm from the Midwest, but I choose to live in the Northeast because I love the energy and I love the fact that everyone in the Northeast is angry for absolutely no reason at all. <laughs> From Philadelphia to Boston, pissed off. Right? That whole Acela line, I call it the corridor of hate. Thank you, Chris. So we live in a very secular, non believing area of the country, don't we? What can we do? Paul says the following from Romans 10. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is a difference, or there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So, I have this uh, sign-up sheet for cross paths. Chris, I don't know if you want to show it on the screen for those at home, but cross paths. Notice the, uh, the font is in red. I mean, you know about, well, I crossed paths with so-and-so yesterday at the mall. Well, this is cross paths. So what, uh, what I'm hoping to do 
is cross paths with the secular world in our Audubon down in the county park and meet folks face to face. And uh, the outreach plan would just involve myself and two others interacting with folks as they're walking around the lake. By the way, if we take Graysbury and go straight down to the lake, that's where we're going to meet. That lake, by the way, Pastor Garrett, that's not Audubon Lake. That's actually Haddon Lake. Audubon Lake is a little bit further west on the other side of uh, that little bridge. So uh, a lot of people in Audubon are accustomed just call it Audubon Lake. Hey, it's in Audubon and close to Mount Ephraim. And, but uh, yeah. So what I'd like a few of us to do, we'll, we'll wear these green shirts and uh, um, just take 30 minutes, walk around, and just say good morning to folks. Consider it a prayer walk. Ask if there's something that they would like us to pray for them about. That's first on the agenda. Giving love, Christian love, to those, and so many are hurting, most people, we saw it happen Friday night. People are willing to share a prayer. So I'm asking for folks to consider walking with me on Saturday, October 23rd at 10 o'clock, straight down this road at Graysbury where that little church is at 10 a.m. I'll know ahead of time who has signed up and we'll meet there and... Uh, just walk around the park, 30, 40 minutes. Chris, would you put the Apostle Creed up? So let's say you don't have a story, but you're, you're a believer. Maybe you could share a part of the Apostle's Creed. I, I, we have all kinds of cards now, thanks to the Acts 29 committee. We can hand out our Acts 29 cards. We can potentially answer a tough question or two, and if we can't answer it, just like Bob Condras did at, in our uh, Bible study, he had to do a little homework last week and found an answer to one of his students' questions. So uh, that's what we're there for, to help uh, bring people to Christ. And And... And maybe you ask, well, you know, what's holding you back from attending church? We, could, uh, we have a lot of booklets from Max Lucado and others that we can share. But the bottom line is we want to just present our God to those in the secular world. So let me uh, read this from 2 Timothy. Paul reminds us of the following. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Pastor Mike Fabrera, Carol Tate, turned me on to that guy. He told an interesting story that applies. He was telling a, a story about a family that was in this little gift shop with expensive items. And uh, this, this family had a young man who put his hand in a vase, but he couldn't get the hand out of the vase. So the, the parents are very upset. They, they see the price tag on this vase, or should I say vase, and uh, they're in a corner huddled around trying desperately to get the hand out, and they go, oh, this isn't going to work. So they go to the clerk, the owner of the store, and uh, say, uh, we have a situation here. 
do you have any soap or anything that we can use to help release our son's hand from this vase? Uh, they tried that with no luck. So the owner says, well, I guess you're going to have to buy it. I'll go get a hammer. And so he goes in the back and comes out with a hammer. And just before he's ready to hit this vase, the little boy says, oh, hey, Dad, do you think it would be better if I just let go of the quarter? <laughs> so, uh, hey, listen, there, there's going to be a, a day of judgment for all of us. You know, uh, most of the near-death experience stories include a life review. I mean, if you have Jesus in your heart and you, you call him your savior, you've got the green light, but there's probably going to be a life review. And that life review hopefully will uh, include where you checked off that box of you reaching out to those who are unbelievers. My sister who experienced, you may recall, that NDE, she had that life review in her, in her experience. The Lord asks us to proclaim the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Don't you want to check that off on your bucket list? So, this morning, place your hope and purpose completely in God's hands, but please share it with our neighbors. Now, we'll have a hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. benediction. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of peace be with you all. Have a great week. Just a couple announcements. Uh, the uh, Organist Guild, again, will be meeting next Sunday at 4 o'clock right here. So you're welcome to join. And uh, for those of you at home who would care to sign up on, on our uh, 
on our walk around the lake, cross paths, you can uh, text me at 609-605-5450. My num number's there with the Cancer with Hope uh, parts of our website. So have a great week.